Hey, hey, everybody, I hope you're doing well today. Well, let's take a look at market structures, this introduction and overview video that's going to help you understand what we do in theory of the firm with the model that you learn at the beginning called production, costs, revenues, and profits. Okay, here we go. All right, the market structures. These are the case studies, right? These are the case studies to which you are going to apply the cost, revenue, and profit model that you learned in the first chapter. All right, so what are they? Well, they're perfect competition, monopoly, monopolistic competition, and oligopoly. Okay, these four market structures are what exists in the marketplace that we are going to apply the production, costs, revenues, and profit model that all firms do, that model is a model that goes on in theory inside firms when they're trying to decide what the perfect price is for each particular good that they make. Then these market structures are structures that exist on the outside of the firm that they might participate in. So think about costs, revenues, and profits, sometimes called production, costs, revenues, and profit, as a model that you're going to apply to these things, okay? So here's another way of thinking about it. Every firm's going to do, figure out what their cost, revenue, and profit are, but the way they behave is going to be dictated by the structure in which they have to behave. So if they're in a perfect competition market, they're going to behave a certain way. If they're a monopoly, they're going to behave a certain way. If they're a monopolistic competition, they're going to behave a certain way. Oligopoly, they're going to behave a certain way. And those behaviors are going to be different, just like you behave different at school than you do at home, than you do with your grandparents, than you do with your friends. Okay? You're still you. You still make the same decisions, right? But the way that you behave in the marketplace or in the structures, um, or the way that you behave is dictated by the structures around you. All right. So have that in your mind, right? And here's the other thing, and this is the thing that's super important, I think, for econ students to realize, is that <laughs> economics is human behavior. And you know for sure that if you are a monopoly, you are the only game in town, you are going to charge as high a price as possible. And still, hopefully, people will be able to, to afford it, right? So you can maximize your profits. If you're an oligopoly, you're going to have a few competitors, right? But you're still going to try to charge as high as you can based on what they do in order to... Um, maximize your profits. And in perfect competition, which by the way I'm going to talk about in a second, which is the opposite of monopoly, this is where there's, there's like no barriers of entry and, and there's, there's incredible amounts of competition, you're going to behave a different way. Right? And you know that. You know that if you were just going to start your own little business and you have this knowledge because this is human behavior. Economics is human behavior turned into philosophy. And the philosophy is what <laughs> turns into how we behave in certain market structures because frankly, you know, it's just human behavior put on flat diagrams. All right, so let's take a look at market, the market structures, the first two, perfect competition and monopoly. All right, perfect competition. It is obviously one of the four market structures with the following characteristics. Number one, a large number of small firms in market in perfect competition, they, the, the firms have no control over price. All firms are sell a homogenous product, there are no barriers of entry, and there's perfect information and perfect resource mobility. Examples of this, agricultural and commodity markets and the foreign exchange market. Okay, first thing, the idea of perfect competition, guess what? It's super theoretical. I think the best way of explaining how this works is if you have ever traveled and exchange money from one currency to the other because that is a market and the foreign exchange market, guess where they get the exchange rate from the outside. They get it from the Forex market, from the foreign exchange markets where there's massive amounts of currencies traded every day. That's where the price comes from. The firms that operate in the market structure perfect competition have no control over price. They're what is called price takers. If you're a price taker and you try to change the price, you ain't going to stay in business very long. Just think about yourself at an airport or like, I don't know, in some tourist area traveling and you want to change whatever currency you have in your pocket to another currency and you roll up and there's four kiosks, right? And three of them have the same price because they use the, the, the Forex market price from the currency markets and one is trying to, you know, charge you too much. Are you going to go there? No. 
you're not going to go there. So if you're in the foreign exchange market, right, if you have a kiosk, what are you going to do to attract visitors? Well, you're going to have a nice store. Maybe you have, you know, the way that it looks outside. You have your people in uniforms. You make yourself look professional, right? Because you ain't changing the price. All right. So that's perfect competition. The other thing that's super important is this realize that there are no barriers to entry. And this barrier of entries thing is really important, and they're different in the different market structures. And I want you to think about it this way. If you think about a high school soccer game, at my, most high school, think of it in like a, like a metaphorical sense. Most high school soccer games, you can just kind of roll up and watch the game. There's basically no barriers to entry. You don't need any money. Maybe you got to you know, get past the front gate. But after that, you can just kind of get there. Or if there is you know, a charge to get into the game, it's pretty nominal, right? Okay. As opposed to going to you know, a National Basketball Association game or like a professional soccer game you know, in, in, in London, like, there's a lot of barriers to entry. First of all, the tickets are expensive. Third of all, there's a lot of security. And fourth of all, you got to go to the one stadium and you can't just see the game. You have to actually go inside the stadium. Right? So in a metaphorical sense, barriers to entry means that it's very difficult to get in. It's much di more difficult to get into the Arsenal game than it is to get into your high school soccer game. Okay? So metaphorically speaking, think about what, that's what barriers of entry mean. In perfect competition, there's very, very low barriers of entry. All right. Cool. We got that one done. Now, monopoly. Monopoly is one of the four market structures with the following characteristics. And you need all of these. A single dominant large firm. Significant control over price. Producers sell a unique product with no close substitutes. High barriers to entry in the industry. And the examples of these are telephone, water, and electric companies in areas where they operate as a single supplier. When I was a kid, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. And um, there was one <laughs> energy company. And everybody bought their power, their electricity from this one energy company. Now, they, they were a monopoly. They could have charged whatever they wanted. And in order to control them, the government regulated what the prices were. But they had complete power over the market, right? Another example also from the 80s and 90s was Microsoft. And obviously, Microsoft is still around. But Microsoft created the dominant operating system in the world still today, which is the DOS system originally that Bill Gates you know, came up with along with his friends. And it turned into the Windows system. Great. So they're, they're a monopoly in the, in the operating systems. But then what they tried to do is use that market structure right, to sell other products, and that's how Microsoft Word became what it was, and that's how PowerPoint became what it is, and also they tried to do, to use that power to, to, to integrate something called Internet Explorer, which was a web browser, right, when the internet was coming out in the mid-90s, and they tried to use one market power that they had of monopoly in, um, in the operating system, and they made their operating system, which controls that particular PC, only be able to use the web browser, which controls access to the web. And they, that monopolistic power got broken down by the United States uh, uh, Justice Department, and they, they thought of the abuse of power. So monopolies is a, is a way in which governments, I'm sorry, rather firms operate. And of course, if you have your cost, revenue, profit, and you're the only show in town, well, then guess what? You can charge whatever price you want, in theory, so long as people can afford it. Okay? So that is monopoly. All right, let's look, take a look at the third and fourth market structure. Monopolistic competition. Check it. Monopolistic competition, what is it? It's one of four market structures. This is the one that students have the most difficult kind of understanding. One of four market structures with the following characteristics. A large number of firms, substantial control over market price, product differentiation, no barriers to entry. Hmm, or very low barriers of entry. The best example, I think, is actually not shoe companies, clothing companies, detergent, computer publishing. Okay, that comes from Jocelyn Blink, but I actually think the best example is a monopolistic competition would be like, let's say that you live in a small western town of the United States, maybe in like western Colorado or something, I don't know. I live in Santiago, Chile, so this is far from, from a place I've been lately. I used to live in Breckenridge, Colorado, but let's say that you decided to open up a sushi restaurant, yeah? And there's no other sushi restaurants in this small little town. And great. So what are you? You are, check it, a monopoly of what? Sushi. But that's not the only market that you compete in. The market that you compete in is the market for the going out to dinner market, right? The dining market. So while you, are a mon you have a monopoly in your, in, your, in your one thing, you're actually part of a, of a, of a market that's bigger than you. 
So as a result of that, you're going to have to compete in a very highly competitive market, which is restaurants, right? The restaurant industry. So you can't really charge whatever you want for your sushi rolls because if you price your sushi rolls too expensive, too high, they're too, they're too expensive, then people aren't going to go to your restaurant. They're going to go have some Italian dinner. They're going to go to a burrito joint or they're going to go get some good, um, I don't know, um, some other kind of food. I can't even think of it. They're going to go to a steakhouse and have a good steak. So even though you're monopoly in your product, in sushi, you're going to have to price your product with products that you're competing against heavily, which would be, you know, like a plate of pasta at a nice uh, Italian restaurant or, you know, a really good burrito at a Mexican restaurant, okay? So that is how a monopolistic competition market works. And I like the shoe companies here, and those of you who live in the United States or those of you who follow basketball or those of you who follow soccer, I can use, you know, two examples. It's like, you know, the shoe market is, like, pretty, it's, like, super highly competitive. So what do they try to get a monopoly on? They try to get a monopoly on really famous uh, athletes. You know, that's why Lionel Messi... You know, that's why Adidas is paying him millions of dollars a year. You know, LeBron James and Kyrie Irving in basketball, that's why they're getting paid millions of dollars a year because, quite frankly, it's pretty cool to have LeBrons. And if you have LeBrons, well, then that's a monopoly on any sort of shoe that has LeBron's name on it. And LeBron James is undoubtedly the best player in the world right now in basketball. So guess what? They, Nike kind of has a monopoly on basketball shoes that have LeBron's name on it, but they're competing in a broader market. So it's monopolistic competition. All right. And last one, oligopoly. Oligopoly is one of four market structures with the following characteristics. A small number of large firms in the industry. Firms have significant control over price. Firms are interdependent on each other. Products may be differentiated or homogenous, and there are high barriers to entry. And I actually think the best example of this is the car industry. Maybe not so much now, um, but maybe like 20 years ago. Um, before Hyundai was a global product coming out of South Korea, which is just astounding. What South Korea has done is astounding, absolutely astounding. Um, before Mahindra came out of, China, uh, out of India, and out of you know, China comes the brand of Great Wall, which is a, you know, part of a larger conglomerate of car makers. But before that, in the United States at least, you had Ford, Chrysler, GM. They are the only companies that made cars. Then later on, Honda came in, Toyota came in in terms of like the regular, you know, sort of mid-range car prices. Of course, there's, there's BMW and there's the higher end uh, Mercedes-Benz and some, sh and of course, you know, cars from Europe. But in terms of like in the United States, they're basically like five cars, five car companies, right? They're an oligopoly. Is it hard to get into that industry? Yeah, you got to have you got to have millions and millions of dollars and a lot of expertise to, come to start making cars. So those firms could have worked as an oligopoly, or they do work as an oligopoly, but they could have actually colluded together to set the price of cars. And also, they're interdependent on one another. So if all of a sudden, which happened after the September 11th, uh, 2001 uh, events in New York City and in, in Washington, D.C., um, people in the United States stopped, st they, they, they stopped uh, flying in planes, right? And also, the price of gasoline went way up because the price of oil went way up. And guess what happened? The car industries really, really suffered. And they all suffered at once because they're interdependent on one another. Okay? So other examples of this would be like airlines, electrical appliance, uh, uh, electrical appliance manufacturers, steel, aluminum, copper, cement industry. Semex is a great example. Um, Semex is a huge company that practically owns the cement market in Mexico. It comes from Mexico and Central America. I lived in Nicaragua for four years and like the only options you have are basically Semex Cement. Super interesting company, very powerful. Um, but they work, of course, in, in, in competition with other large cement manufacturers. Okay, so there are the four market structures. Perfect competition, monopoly, monopolistic competition, oligopoly. These are the market structures that you are going to look at for um, how the firms behave using the model that you used of, of uh, production, costs, revenues, and profits. All right, my friends, I hope you found this video to be helpful, and I'll talk to you in a bit.